advocates about the multiple challenges of a, a very uh, of an infection due to a very resistant pathogen. I would just like to say that my slides are a compilation of my slides, slides from previous presentations used by Anais Eskenazi, but also from Tatiana Charles, which is an orthopedic surgeon uh, here at our hospital. And uh, so, sorry. So the story actually starts out uh, a little bit of time ago. So a 31 years old woman was brought into the emergency room, victim of a terrorist bomb attack. And uh, when she arrived at the emergency room, she was in hypovolemic shock from uh, excessive and extensive bleeding. And uh, very quickly upon arrival to the emergency room, she actually has uh, two cardiac arrests, needing cardio um, respiratory resuscitation. The first thing to do for this patient is actually to stabilize the situation, and so she actually received massive transfusions. We embolized some of the bleeding foci. She needed abdominal surgery, uh, needing clamping of uh, the primitive external iliac artery. Furthermore, uh, we also had to uh, make amends with her colon, and we needed to extract uh, some metal from the pelvis. And to be able to close up the abdominal cavity, we actually uh, needed to use a vacuum-assisted closure, and there's a picture in uh, the lower corner of the slide showing what a vacuum-assisted closure uh, is. And uh, then the patient also needed to benefit from orthopedic surgery. Uh, for the orthopedic surgery, she needed, we needed to do extensive cleaning of the wounds and also packing to stop the bleeding. And this woman had uh, multifocal fractures of her femur, left femur, and so this is actually fixed uh, with an external fixator. We also were missing, or there was or substance missing to be able to close correctly the wound. So once again, we had to use this technique of vacuum-assisted closure. Now, her evolution following the very first uh, day uh, still remained complicated because actually already on day three, the patient is going to develop a septic shock, which is a very, very serious uh, life-threatening infection. Uh, due to the wound infection of the left thigh. I'm going to come back to this infection later on, um, but in order to be able to help heal uh, the, the thigh and even help with the infection, we actually performed what we call a muscle graft. Uh, and so we actually took a muscle from her back and we tried to use it to cover up the wound of her left thigh to bring vascularization to uh, her thigh. <coughs> In the meantime, already when we arrived to about a month or day 24 after she arrived to the intensive care unit, she also developed a deep invasive fungal infection, which is also an infection which has a very high mortality rate. And uh, she necrosed all of her gut cavity or her wall. And so actually we once again had to be very aggressive with her treatment. She needed to undergo what we call a splenectomy, so we had to remove her um, spleen. She also uh, benefited from a total gastrectomy, so we removed her stomach. She needed to receive very high dosage regimens of antifungal treatment, which is particularly uh, toxic. And uh, we also gave her some experimental immunotherapy. So that was taken care of, but also in the meantime, on day 38, she actually necrosed the muscle graft that we had put on her thigh, and it needed to be removed. So now I'm just going to go ahead and come back to the septic shock that she developed on day three um, of her, after her arrival to the emergency room. And actually this infection was due to um, a polymicrobial infection. And so basically it means that there were many bacteria involved in the infection, which is not so surprising because her wounds when she arrived at the hospital were all open. And so we found many different pathogens such as Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Enterobacter cloacae, Enterococcus fissium and Klebsiella pneumoniae. And I'm going to actually concentrate on this Klebsiella pneumoniae because it's really this pathogen that ultimately has caused the, the most problems. As you can see here, I have shown you um, an antibiogram of uh, uh, the Klebsiella pneumoniae when she arrived uh, to, so on day three of arrival to the hospital. What's in red shows you antibiotics that are actually uh, resistant to uh, or for, for which the, bacteria, the antibiotics are resistant to, to the bacteria. In green, we have the treatments that are actually effective in vitro against the bacteria. And in orange, we have antibiotics which show some kind of efficacy against the bacteria, but um, it's not great. What you have to know is that what is in red is actually our first-line treatment. It's antibiotics that have little toxicity. They're called beta-lactans. And it's what we usually use uh, on a day-to-day -day basis to treat infections. 
And so we were actually already obliged to move uh, very early, or early on to use uh, second line treatments, which means treatments that are a lot more expensive, but also that have a lot more toxicities. And even on the, when we look at efficaciousness, uh, we consider that they are a lot less efficacious to treat infections. And so uh, dealing with this infection that was very severe, we actually decided to give very high dosage regimens of antibiotics, and we gave quite a cocktail of antibiotics. So we gave piperacillin tazobactam, meropenem, vancomycin, amikacin, colistin, and phosphomycin. And all of these treatments were monitored with therapeutic drug monitoring. And we pushed the dosage regimens to sometimes three to four times the standard dosage regimens to really be able to try to treat this infection. Because as you, I think, have realized, we were not only treating a soft tissue infection, but we were treating also bones. And bones are very difficult to treat because you have to get the antibiotics into the bones and that can be actually pretty complicated. Furthermore, when you have a lot of pieces of bones that are free in the thigh, even if we've done extensive cleaning, the bacteria can still form what we call a biofilm, and so it's kind of a protection against any kind of uh, immunological response by the host, but also uh, it's a protection against antibiotics, and therefore it's a lot difficult to treat these infections. As you can see, the patient actually receives this very uh, extensive and uh, rich cocktail of antibiotics for a very prolonged period of time because when you have an infection of the bone, you actually minimally need to treat the infections for six weeks and sometimes you need to treat it even longer. Well, things do go better and finally we're able to simplify the treatment to only uh, two antibiotics for still another two weeks. And finally, on day 84, we decide to stop all antibiotics, and the patient is actually discharged from the intensive care unit and makes it up to the general ward of internal medicine. Now, in the following days and uh, over the next couple of months, she's going to, we're going to be more focused on her rehabilitation. And uh, unfortunately, about two weeks after stopping antibiotic therapy, we actually see that there's actually a purulent discharge that has uh, begun to form from the orifices of uh, the pins coming out of the external fixators. And the patient also develops what we call a fistula, so it's actually pus coming from deep down uh, in the leg. Furthermore, there are no, there's absolutely no consolidation of the left femur. And this basically continues for quite some time. And so finally, we realize that we actually, we're going to have to be, uh, do something about that. And uh, furthermore, the external fixator that we had placed originally when she arrived at the hospital would not allow her to sit appropriately, and so it actually was hindering her rehabilitation process. So on day 170, we went back to surgery. We once again did a very extensive uh, cleaning of the wound. We took new microbiological samples, and we changed the external fixator. And we once again, this is just to show you that so even at day 170 after she arrived at the hospital, she still did not have any kind of consolidation of her left femur. Now, once again, in the new microbiological samples, you see that we once again find Klebsiella pneumoniae, and uh, it is not so surprising that after having received a lot of antibiotics, the two strains that we were able to identify were much more resistant than her original strain um, when she arrived first to the hospital. And so, we realized that it was really time to start thinking out of the box. We had a chronic infection of this uh, bone, and uh, I would say that Dr. Iskinazi at the time was uh, a doctor in training for infectious diseases, and I think it was thanks to her that uh, she did really some uh, real thinking out of the box, and I'm going to come to what uh, she suggested a little bit later on. In the meantime, a new antibiotic uh, treatment was initiated uh, with high-dose meropenem, colistin, cotrimoxazole, clarithromycin, rifampicin, and ethambutol. And as I said, we tried to think out of the box. And so actually Dr. Eskenazi found that actually there were cases that we could possibly treat using what we call phage therapy. What is phage therapy? It is the fact that we're going to treat patients with an infection with DNA or RNA viruses that are going to really infect the bacteria and therefore destroy the bacteria. Uh, the advantages of using this phage therapy is that the viruses uh, that we would be using do not infect human cells and the phage therapy can actually be found, these viruses can be found everywhere in the microbiome and the environment. Uh, and what we did already know, because phage therapy was actually discovered way in the 1920s, but it was really put to the side in most places or most countries because we developed antibiotics in the meantime. 
Um, and so we did, there have been work carried out on phages, and so we did still know that phages are species, but also strain specific. And so if we wanted to give a phage therapy, we would need to give a cocktail of multiple phages to be able to target either multiple species or even multiple strains in among one species. We also knew um, from a couple of in vitro studies that phage therapy seemed to have some kind of action, positive action against biofilms. And so the next step was to say, well, how are we going to get the phages? And I guess we're very lucky in Belgium because actually the Belgian military hospital has been active in studying phages for over 20 to 30 years. And so Dr. Eskenazi contacted Professor Pirnay and also Dr. Mera Chivili. And uh, they were actually able to let us know that um, unfortunately in Belgium we have no access to phages that are active against Klebsiella. But they actually facilitated contact with what we call the Eliava Institute of Bacteriophages, Microbiology and Virology in Georgia. And so Dr. Eskenazi went to Georgia to actually find out more about these phages. So she found out how they were produced and she also was able to make contacts and she was actually able to find out that they actually in Georgia and in Poland have libraries of phages um, and amongst these library of phages, they actually have phages active against Klebsiella pneumoniae. And so we have found our phages, but in the meantime, you have to also know that there are ethical considerations. So first of all, we had to ask ourselves, what are the risks for this patient considering to give a virus therapy to a patient? Well, in the literature, what we could find was that there were, the risks were probably minimal, maybe a, an allergic reaction, maybe a little bit of eczema. And then the other problems were that maybe if we gave phage therapy, the patient could develop rapid resistance to this treatment. And the other concern was that we possibly, by giving a virus to treat the infection, the virus could actually transfer some DNA uh, to the bacteria and actually uh, confer more virulence uh, to the bacteria that we were trying to treat. Furthermore, uh, we were also concerned by the fact that there were actually very few uh, published clinical trials on phagotherapy in English concerning efficacy and safety. And certainly we had no idea what the optimal dosage regimens were. We didn't even know if we should be giving it orally, intravenously, locally. Um, and there were questions concerning still the techniques of phage production. Nevertheless, um, we did move forward. And as you can say, it was a slow process because it took us all the way to day 700, and in the meantime, this patient was rece receiving antibiotic therapy. And uh, so it took us till day 700 to receive the phages, have uh, approval from the ethics committee, and really decide as a medical team that we were going to go forward and uh, give this phage cocktail to the patient. So on day 700, we, we received the phages. We then were able to verify very quickly the purity of the phage cocktail. And uh, on day 702, the patient underwent surgery once again. This time, we once again did a very large debridement of the wound. Uh, the orthopedic surgeons also placed rifampicine impregnated autologous bone graft in all of the areas where there was a loss of substance of bone. And furthermore, at the end of the surgery, they placed a catheter in the wound in order to be able to administer um, phage cocktail therapy. And so at the end of the surgery, we did a kind of a wash of phage cocktail. So the patient received 100 milliliters of phage cocktail. And then this treatment was pursued for five days where the patient received still 20 milliliters three times a day by local installation. We also took microbiological samples uh, again during this surgery. And uh, I guess what was even, well, it's not so surprising, but this time we really had strains of Klebsiella that were absolutely resistant to all antibiotics available, except for um, an intermediate in vitro um, susceptibility to what we call cyclin. And for the first time, we were able to show that there was a beta-lactam that was actually active against this bacteria. And that's because septazidine avibactam had just recently made it to the market, and unfortunately not in Belgium, but we were able to ask for compassionate use of this antibiotic, and so in the end, we were able to administer phages, and we were able to administer what we consider a more adequate antibiotic regimen to this patient. And so then the patient left the hospital to go back to her rehabilitation center, and we saw her in consultation while still receiving all of these antibiotics on day 798. And I must say, the change was amazing. She definitely had a significant um, improvement of her general status. She had gained five kilos, and for the first time, we had a significant consolidation of the left fracture femur. 
And as you can see locally, we actually had a situation where we had the leg that there was no more pus coming out of the fixators, and we all decided that we could stop all antibiotic therapy. On day 806, we were able to remove the external fixator, and microbiological samples taken for culture on day 1806 were actually um, remained negative for the first time in basically two years. And so we were definitely um, very happy with uh, arriving to this point. We must admit and say that although the microbiological samples remain negative, to this day we cannot actually say currently that the infection is cured because we are talking about an infection of a bone infection. And so we need a lot more follow-up time to be able to conclude that the infection is really gone. Um, but we definitely have made progress, and I think that's where I would like to end. So let's move to the topic of phages. We heard that we are really facing a major public health issue. We understand that there are many aspects to be considered to address this issue. You know, the numbers of deaths caused by AMR in 2050 are really frightening. So, but in the meantime, what do we do? And uh, in the meantime, it might be, and that's the question I will ask to Bob Blasdell and uh, Jean-Paul Pionnet to answer, are phages the way forward? Bob is uh, currently working in a small company, Des Pharma, which actually is aiming at developing uh, phages as an accessible therapy. But before that, he uh, performed a number of very important studies in the field of phages, first in the United States, and more recently at KU Leuven in the lab of Bob Lavi. So Bob, you start, and then we will add Jean-Paul Pionnet and based on what you said. Great. Thank you for the introduction, Michelle. So I'm going to start by uh, mentioning the, the history of phage therapy, as Maya has already briefly mentioned. Uh, in August of 1915, oh. Ten infantrymen in the French, and mounted infantrymen in the French army contracted severe hemorrhagic dysentery, and a man named Felix Durel was sent out to investigate from the Pasteur Institute to see what had happened and also if there was anything that could be done for it. Oh. And he isolated a pseudonymous uh, bacillus, uh, which he then uh, ended up streaking out onto a plate and finding bacteriophages against. Oh. And so uh, this was the, the first. This resulted in the first real description of a bacteriophage that really understood uh, a significant amount of the, the biology of, of bacteriophages. And in, in 1917, he then published his findings in the uh, French Academy of Science and, and coined the name bacteriophages. So what is a phage? Uh, this is an example of phage T4. Uh, the, the tailed bacteriophages that we're talking about using for, for phage therapy are are assemblages of protein and, and DNA. There's DNA uh, here in the capsid, uh, which then is squirted into bacterial cells in order to infect those bacterial cells. It starts with uh, attachment, uh, which is a selective process where bacteriophages identify hosts uh, that they can infect and, and move on from hosts that, from bacteria that they cannot infect. Uh, from there, uh, the uh, DNA gets uh, injected into the cell, uh, where it then uh, converts the cell from being something sort of like a, a cell-making factory, a cell that makes more cells, into being a phage-making factory, so kind of like converting a, a car-making factory into becoming a motorcycle-making factory. Many of the, the same components are, are needed in much the same way. Many of them need, need to be repurposed in various different ways, and there are new components that the phage will then bring in the genetic information for in order to accomplish producing a, a, a phage-making factor. Oh. Then uh, the, the phage will then synthesize the, uh, the DNA that it needs to package into, it, in, into phage particles as well as the, the phage particles themselves uh, before assembling those phage particles with the DNA and, and the protein and then lysing the cell uh, to then release 30 to 3,000 new bacteria phage particles that then go on to infect more cells creating a, a, a growth, at least in exponentially growing cultures of bacteria, that is, that is dramatically exponential. So uh, this is then visible to the naked eye in a <coughs> phage plaque, uh, where uh, 
on this th this plate, which is similar to what Felix Durrell originally saw in 1915, uh, you can see the results of individual phage particles uh, uh, that are placed onto a lawn of growing bacteria, which then grow at the expense of those bacteria, creating a, a visible dead spot, sort of like a, a tooth mark out of the phage, where what you're seeing isn't the phage itself, but the, the bacteria that they've killed. Uh, which then grows into something like an anti-colony. Uh, when I think of phage, really what I think of is the, the phage plaque, the, the results of what the phage does. So, uh, soon after uh, Felix Durrell uh, did, did his work in both uh, France and the United States, he moved to uh, the, what is now the Republic of Georgia and the Soviet Union, uh, potentially at the, at the invitation of Stalin, uh, where uh, he uh, promulgated his model for phage therapy, where in, in his model, uh, he created uh, two primary cocktails called intestophage against intestinal pathogens and pheophage against pyrulent, pyrulent path pathogens of pyrulent wounds, uh, where he found a phage that would work against one of the bacteria that was a problem, uh, which, would have, which the bacteria would eventually become, particularly in the population, would eventually become resistant to. Uh, and then, once more phages were needed, more phages were added into the cocktail. And over the last hundred years or so, this cocktail has grown uh, uh, to become a, a, a marvelously complex evolutionary experiment, if nothing else. Uh, <coughs> where it's needed to be, over the last 80 years, it's needed to be updated somewhere around every six months or so in order to stay current with the, uh, with, with the population of bacteria that that were ailing people in then the Soviet Union, now the Republic of Georgia. Uh, however, uh, this model uh, is not really functional in the West, uh, where the, the drug that this produces uh, is really not classifiable. It, it can't be understood on a molecular level. Uh, it, it's, uh, the, these phases that have been in this cocktail for the last 80 years have evolved inside the cocktail, and we'll never really be able to isolate every single one of them. It's, 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 and then characterize every single one of them. It's, it's simply not practical. No. And so even though uh, these cocktails are, would be appropriate for compassionate use in the West, they'll, they'll never really be marketable. So in, to have phage therapy work in the West, we need another solution. Now, one of the other solutions that's currently favored by, by many other companies is uh, developing cocktail, individual characterized cocktails of phages, well, where phages you know, will only infect a, a, a single, generally only a single species of bacteria, and generally only a, a small subset of uh, a species of bacteria, a subset of clinical isolates. Uh, and so in order to uh, develop a, a, a single drug that will be able to work against a, a variety of bacteria that are ailing patients, you need to combine phages together into a cocktail in order to have a broad enough combined host range in order to have a, a, a plausible uh, ability to Im impact patient lives. So this involves making a, a, a cocktail of phages, which it, with their combined host ranges will then, yes, uh, be able to uh, address the infections that are, at least a majority of infections that are uh, affecting patients. But the, uh, this, this will run into the, to many of the same problems that on an economic level uh, and on an epidemiological level that antibiotics have, only much faster as resistance to, to phages evolves much faster than it does to, to antibiotics. Where uh, soon, soon after a, a fixed drug is developed, another one will need to be developed, and then another one, perhaps every six months or so, just like in the, in the former Soviet Union. No, maybe every year, uh, but it, it will run into the, the same kind of economic issues where uh, these, these drugs will require stewardship uh, in, in the same way that antibiotics require stewardship, which will uh, reduce the amount at which these drugs are purchased, which will then reduce the, the, the money with, with which to develop more drugs, creating exactly the same vicious cycle. However, uh, the Belgian model uh, avoids this issue. Uh, where in, in the Belgian model, uh, we ha we're developing a a large library of phages, uh, which we will then select from in order to make uh, cocktails of phages that will be individualized to a specific patient. So uh, for a specific patient, three phages from our library that we know will infect that, that the strain that's affecting them uh, will be uh, compounded by a pharmacist 
into a, uh, a, a magistral preparation such that each individual patient gets a unique, uh, a unique uh, preparation specifically for them. So, uh, in general, phage therapy has a lot of uh, particularly interesting advantages. So, there are bacterial satellite agents. The moment a phage interacts with its host bacteria, that, that bacteria is dead. Uh, it will, it, it, uh, phage predation is fundamentally and permanently incompatible with life. Uh, it has, it, they have a low inherent toxicity. Uh, we have phages in us and on us constantly. They're part of our normal, healthy microbiome. Uh, but they also cause in their host specificity, a, a minimal di disruption of host flora, uh, uh, reducing the chance of uh, causing dysbiosis. But also, they, they, uh, resistance to antibiotics does, has no relationship to resistance to phages. And so uh, they're just as appropriate for antibiotic-resistant bacteria as they are antibiotic-sensitive bacteria. Now, at, sa at the same time, uh, they're rapidly discovered uh, just by dangling a, uh, a new pathogen in front of an environmental sample will be able to isolate uh, new phages against uh, that new sample from from from, from the environment. Uh, and in the environment, there is there is a functionally infinite supply of bacteriophages. Uh, there's 10 to the 31st of them on the planet. Uh, but also that they have, many bacteriophages have a remarkable ability to clear clear biofilms, having been already adapted by a, a billion of years of evolution to uh, combat biofilms. But at the same time, there are a few specific challenges. Uh, not all phages make for good therapeutics. Uh, Maya mentioned the, uh, in her slides the difference between mitic and, and temperate phages, where temperate phages will, instead of killing their, their uh, bacterial host, often inject their genome inside the, the, genome, the genome of the host and hide, uh, often bringing virulence factors. No. But, they also have, there's also an unclear relation, still relatively unclear relationship between bacteriophages and the, and, uh, human, the human immune system, uh, where how the human immune system really does react to phages uh, is, is still not very well studied. How, how long phages will persist in the human body, uh, what factors affect how long they will persist in the human body are, are still understudied. And there's also the, the challenge of host range that I mentioned before. Uh, and, of course, that uh, resistance will develop faster than with antibiotics. So with that, I'll... Uh, Thank you. Oh, yeah, this is going Thank to be for you. Dr. So, thank you so much. I, I suggest that uh, Jean-Paul Pirelet uh, indeed follow up on this. I would just like to emphasize the role that the um, Belgium Royal Military Queen Astrid Hospital is playing not only in our country, but I would say worldwide. Under the leadership of Jean-Paul Pirelet, you have to know that the, the, the Royal Military Academy and the Military Hospital are really leaders in the field, and uh, I think it would be interesting that you let us know how you, know, you manage to develop this uh, phage therapy and which are your projects for the future. Thank you, uh, Michel. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, I, th I think it's um, not possible to do this in a few slides in a few minutes. Uh, uh, but what we wanted to have in, in Belgium was a uh, uh, pragmatic solution. Because um, uh, what we wanted was a uh, uh, sustainable phage therapy concept. And I say concept because uh, what is always possible is, of course, is to develop phages as uh, uh, medicinal products. This is a classical pathway. You go to uh, the European Medicines Agency, uh, formerly in London, now in Amsterdam, and you, you go for uh, centralized marketing authorization. It will take you 10 years and millions of euros, and then you bring your phage to the market. Uh, but you need to do this for every phage. Every phage is a different medicinal product. So, and uh, this is not the, the way we wanted to go in Belgium. Uh, we wanted to really have a concept where we would be able to, to select and adapt phages for a specific patient or a specific outbreak. Um, so, um, we, we call this uh, approach uh, sustainable, personalized, 
uh, phage therapy concept where we would select uh, the appropriate phage from a collection uh, and we would select the phage that is matched to the infection. Uh, and we would also like to adapt this phage if we have time to do so uh, because we know from, uh, from research that when we have time to adapt the phage to the bacterium this phage will become more active and also will elicit less resistance which is important. And that's also why we call this a sustainable approach. Because uh, as Bob explained, when you will use those broad spectrum cocktails uh, after a while, and even quicker as with antibiotics, you will get resistance. So uh, we had to do a lot of uh, lobbying to, to get this uh, uh, flexible uh, approach. Uh, and, um, and finally, after many years of lobbying in, in 2015, uh, there was some success uh, because in the, the Belgian Parliament, uh, our Minister of Public Health was confronted with uh, questions uh, from, uh, from politicians, uh, from the Green Party, uh, from the Socialist Party. Uh, and uh, what, what they wanted to, to know is why is phage therapy not developed in, in Belgium? And then uh, the, the ministers uh, agreed that there were some problems to develop phage therapy or phages as, as classical medicine products. And then she uh, herself suggested why, why not to develop them as magistral preparations. And then she, she asked her competent authorities for medicines to, to develop a framework uh, with us. And uh, it took uh, more than, uh, than two years to to get this framework, and uh, so I'm happy to say that, that since the beginning of this year, this framework is actually in place in Belgium. You can you can do this. So, and the concept is that you you would have a page bank with page feed lots, which are some kind of starter cultures, small tubes with pages. Uh, these pages would be characterized uh, and stored uh, in a banking system. And then you would select uh, uh, the phages you want to produce, and you would produce them as APIs, which is an API is an active pharmaceutical ingredient. Uh, and these do not need to be produced uh, according to GMP. Uh, it's a much uh, uh, lighter uh, framework. You need to produce them according to a monograph. And we developed such a monograph with the, the authorities. Uh, and then these APIs need to be tested uh, according to the monograph by a Belgian approved laboratory. And then these uh, pages, they can go to the hospital pharmacy and then upon prescription by a medical doctor, they can be integrated by pharmacists in magistral preparations. So uh, many of those pages uh, can then be mixed uh, by a pharmacist in a carrier, it can be an hydrogel, or any buffer, um, and then they can uh, be applied to the patient. Thank you so much for this presentation and for what you do to make phage therapy accessible to more patients. Such as in our case, I think it's quite remarkable because it, it demonstrates that you need more than soft science. You need also to address all these other hurdles, uh, uh, economic, regulatory, and that we, we, we just heard. And well, we hope that our country is indeed in a good position to, to, to actively contribute to the development of this uh, new type of therapy. Now, uh, when we discuss about, you know, the clinic, the future of healthcare, very often there is one voice which is missing, which is the voice of the patient. And I'm really very grateful to the patient that will be presented to you today to be present with us. Thank you, Professor um, I am Vincent of your The way that the process was presented uh, sounds like a drug miracle. And I want to say in my case, it actually was. It, it worked. Um, I'm led to believe uh, because of the symptoms that I was experiencing before uh, it was administrated rather than afterwards that it was a success. And the reason for that is um, because of the fact that I'm here today. 
that I'm standing up on my two feet with my leg that was severely injured, without the antibiotics and without the external fixator. Now, let me remind you, let me put you back into the setting of um, when I arrived at the hospital. And um, I'm sure you all remember the date of 22 March 2016. On that day, there was the bombing attacks in Brussels. And I happened to be one of those only two people that was severely injured. And not only was I severely injured, but I shouldn't be here today. And not just on one occasion, on 22 March, but on multiple occasions, I had plenty, plenty, plenty of time to actually die. And for many weeks, for many months, I was in and out of the operation theater, um, tested on with experimental drugs, and also the antibiotics. Now, it's my belief today that antibiotics help to stabilize the infection, but it did not cure it. You see, it's interesting to hear from a patient's point of view when I hear the doctor speak about days. Dr. Hittes explained uh, earlier, uh, after uh, so many days, 70 days, 100 days, 800 days, I don't know if you can imagine what it is to be for 800 days in the hospital, in a bed, with antibiotics, day in and day out. That was two years of my life in the hospital. Now, the effects were starting to show secondary effects in all the antibiotics. And let me remind you that I do believe that the antibiotics did play a role in stabilizing infection. But I was starting to draw the list of the secondary effects that were starting to show. And I was thinking, how much longer can I last? Now, the operation of the thousands, with the thousands, was performed this year in um, February. Five days. And I can tell you that three months after the operation, three months, I was on my feet, starting to begin color, weight was beginning to show. The tensions that I was going through were, were disappearing. All of the things that I was checking off my, my checklist were gone. Now, I know it sounds like it's impossible, I know it sounds like it's a miracle, but given the state that I was in, given the symptoms and the interaction I was going through, it could only take a miracle for me to be here today. So I think that the class therapy deserves all its attention for not only research, but also for the financing, so that other people can benefit not just me, but other people can benefit with what they're going through, the infections that they're going through, multi-resistant bacteria, and especially then so they don't have to wait so long in order to get treatment, or at least in order for, to give it a shot. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I think that there is really nothing more to say than what you just said, and I thank everyone for attending, especially all the speakers here and also to the remote side. So thank you to everyone, and hopefully we will repeat this live at seminar on another occasion. And thank you very much, especially to you. Thank you.